This is Matthew Cratter's Bitcoin University. Today I want to talk about an attack on Bitcoin node runners. Mechanic made a great point in one of his recent videos that there's a difficulty adjustment for Bitcoin miners. For example, if it becomes too difficult to mine a block and blocks are coming in too slowly, then the Bitcoin protocol will adjust after 2016 blocks. In other words, after about two weeks, the Bitcoin protocol will adjust to make it easier to mine a block of Bitcoin. Unfortunately, there's no such difficulty adjustment for Bitcoin node runners, just for Bitcoin miners. If it becomes too difficult or too costly or too legally risky to run a Bitcoin node, many people will stop running Bitcoin nodes, and then the network will become much less decentralized. And a less decentralized network is a network that is more open to capture and is thus also much less valuable. So that's why tolerating spam on the Bitcoin network is such an unacceptable approach, because spam is a direct attack on node runners. It saddles node runners with data that they're forced to store forever, while miners and crypto VCs run away with the profits. Groups like Mara, people like Fred Thiel, David Bailey, groups like the Taproot Wizards make money off of spam and then they leave you with the eternal bill. It's really a classic tragedy of the commons type of situation. And if you want to learn about who's getting rich from Bitcoin spam, I'll put a link to this video in the description notes below. Now, there's zero reason for my Bitcoin node to relay spam. I don't profit from the spam personally, and I can see that it's bad for the Bitcoin network, both in the short term and in the long term. Spam transactions clog the mempool and compete with my own monetary transactions and drive up my own transaction fees unnecessarily. Once mined, spam transactions remain in the blockchain forever, and it makes me sick actually that I have to store other people's non-monetary garbage on my node. It's even worse for those in the global south. Some poor Guatemalan family in 2082 is going to need to download and store Taproot Wizard spam just because they want to run a Bitcoin node and use it for money and be their own bank. Now, Bitcoin spam apologists will tell you that this family could just run a prune node instead, but this family would then still need to download every single confirm spam transaction in every single block full of spam, wasting expensive bandwidth and computational power on downloading and validating stuff that does nothing to make Bitcoin better money. Bitcoin spam apologists also always forget to tell you that prune nodes are unable to bootstrap new full archival nodes, which is why I sometimes call prune nodes castrated nodes since they can never beget new full archival Bitcoin nodes. Bitcoin spam apologists also forget to tell you that you can't run an effective Electrum server or Electrum Rust server with a prune node, so it becomes pretty worthless for your wallet. If you're finding this video interesting so far, just pause really briefly here to ask you to help to support the channel. Hit the subscribe button, that does really help. Leave a like, leave a comment, question, suggestion for a future video, and share this video with a friend or family member. So spam is an attack on Bitcoin nodes and Bitcoin node runners, because if you open up more space for non-monetary data in Bitcoin transactions and blocks, as Bitcoin Core has done by refusing to fix the inscriptions bug and by blowing open opportune default settings in Bitcoin Core version 30 last year, if you do these things, you open up Bitcoin and Bitcoiners to the multifarious attacks and risks that come with relaying and storing non-monetary data like state secrets, trade secrets, intellectual property, private personal information, and even gross things like CSAM. Non-monetary data is subject to many different legal and cultural risks across different jurisdictions worldwide. And what is culturally acceptable in one area may be highly culturally offensive or illegal in another area. Now, even if it's illegal, I'm willing to break the law by storing a ledger of past financial transactions. It's currently not illegal, but even if it were, I'd still be willing to store a ledger of past financial transactions, even if some of those transactions were done by really bad people for really bad things. Again, this is just a record, a monetary or financial record. And I'm willing to do this because this is what's necessary if I want global neutral money and I want other node runners to store my transactions. But I'm not willing to relay or store unnecessary non-monetary data that does not make Bitcoin better money, but instead opens me up as a node runner to many unnecessary risks. That's why I run Bitcoin Knots and use strong mempool filters to ensure that I'm not relaying inscriptions, scammy BRC20 tokens, or large op return CSAM. I'll put a link to this video if you want to learn about Bitcoin Core's original sin and how they refused to fix the inscriptions bug and basically just redefine things to redefine away the bug, as well as this video, which will teach you how to run a Bitcoin Knots node using Start 9.
Now, running Bitcoin Knots is definitely a great start, but unfortunately, it's no longer enough since so many people are running the malware that is Bitcoin Core version 30. We can see here from Clark Moody's Bitcoin dashboard that currently over 4,000 nodes, in other words, about a, little, a bit over 16% of the network is running Bitcoin Core version 30. And that's why we've been talking about upgrading Bitcoin in order to protect it from spam attacks, not just at the mempool policy level as we've been doing with knots, but also at the consensus level, at the level of actual mind blocks and what's allowed by the program protocol. And this is where the talk of soft forks comes in, BIP 110, formerly known as BIP 444, as well as the CAT. As we said, BIP 110 was previously known as BIP 444. BIP just stands for Bitcoin Improvement Proposal. BIP 110 is a soft fork proposal put forward by the NIM, Dathan Ohm, someone who's anonymous as a NIM, that aims to limit Bitcoin spam at the consensus level, rather than just at the mempool policy level, which deals with things, as we said, like filters and what kinds of transactions your node will send to other nodes. Now, if the BIP 110 soft fork is successful, then any block that contains a Bitcoin spam transaction will be rejected by nodes, and the miner who mined that block will not get paid for his work, which is a great way, I think, of punishing and stopping malicious miners who fill up the blockchain with garbage that node runners will need to carry around until the end of time. And it's important to note that BIP 110 this soft fork and the CAT soft fork are not mutually exclusive. What the CAT does, as we've talked about in previous videos, the CAT makes a list of all non-monetary UTXOs, chunks of unspent Bitcoin, a list of all non-monetary UTXOs under 1,000 sats, and then renders them unspendable by consensus as a way of cutting out the economic legs from underneath the spammers. There's not software available for the general public yet for the CAT, but I will cover it when it's available. By contrast, BIP 110 is a temporary soft fork lasting just one year that temporarily limits the size of various data fields at the consensus level. And the reason to do this as a temporary soft fork is so that we don't need to undo it as a using a hard fork. Uh, but this, the idea of doing it as a temporary soft fork is to give everyone time to reconsider what sort of arbitrary non-monetary data we want to allow in Bitcoin while protecting the Bitcoin network and blocks while we're in the process of del deliberation. So that's why it's a temporary one-year soft fork. BIP 110 will protect the network from large opportun CSAM and other horrendous things. It will also stop things like inscriptions, Bitcoin NFTs, and scammy BRC20 tokens that pollute the chain. And it'll stop them at the level of mined blocks, not just at the level of mempool policy. So if this soft fork goes through and a miner mines a block with even one spam transaction in it, that block will be rejected by nodes and the miner will not get paid and will have spent over $300,000 mining that block mm -hmm. in vain. There's a great website here that was put together called bip110.org that does a very nice job of discussing this soft fork proposal as its title, Protecting Bitcoin's Purpose. This soft fork, BIP 110, will temporarily limit the size of data fields at the consensus level in order to correct distorted incentives caused by standardizing support for arbitrary data and to refocus priorities on improving Bitcoin is money. There's a link where you can read the full BIP. And then a few key points, temporary protection, as we talked about, one-year deployment, limits data storage, uh, preserves monetary use, and refocuses Bitcoin. Signals that Bitcoin's priority is not spam and scammy MF NFTs, but its newest priority. And its priority, which it's always been, is being the world's best money, not data storage. Protecting Bitcoin's purpose. Starting with the inscriptions hack in 2022, a trend emerged around embedding arbitrary data into Bitcoin transactions. This creates unnecessary burdens on node operators, as we've been discussing, and diverts development focus from Bitcoin's fundamental purpose being sound, permissionless, borderless money. Bitcoin should do one thing and do it well. And then there's a section here, which we can go through in a later video, that talks about all of the parameters of this soft fork. It will limit transaction outputs to 34 bytes, except for op return, which is allowed up to 83 bytes. Data push limits will be limited to 256 bits, witness version restrictions, taproot restrictions, etc. So you can dig into any of these if you want the technical details, and we'll probably do that in a subsequent video. I would say stay tuned because in my next video, I hope to show you how to download and install the client that will allow you to signal support for the BIP 110 soft fork. And you can see I'm already running it right here. It says Bitcoin Knots BIP 110 UASF user activated soft fork. So this is being 
beginning to be run by people in the community and I want to show you how to do it if this is a sort of soft fork that you support. If you can't wait for tomorrow's video, I'll put a link to Dathan Ohm's post here which will show you all the links you need to start running BIP 110 using Start9, using Umbral, using MyNode, or downloading it as, as a, a standalone client. But we'll be covering this God willing in tomorrow's video. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to hit the subscribe and like buttons. Hit the notification bell if you want to be notified when I publish my next video. And let me know your questions and comments in the comment section below. Thanks all for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.